We've arrived at the um, infamous Royal Medical Research Centre of Oxford University. To introduce, uh, we have three speakers here, um, Mike Huskinson, Peter Egan and myself. Now first up, first up I'm going to introduce Mike Huskinson. Now many of you will know Mike for his undercover work against the hunting community and the amazing stuff he's done to uncover the brutality and barbarity of the hunting scum. But he's also, to me, a hero for another reason. Mike was one of the first people ever to infiltrate the hidden world of the vivisection laboratory. Mike was also, back in the 1970s, the man who famously liberated the smoking beagles from ICI. No one knows better the horrors of vivisection than Mike, and no one has committed more of his life to fighting this cruelty and injustice. So without further ado, give a really big warm welcome to Mike Huskinson. Can you hear me now? Thank you for your attendance here today. It shows how much people care and I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words. I married this course at the age of 18. I'm 65 now. It's, it's the intersection that saddens me. We've made so little progress against this current activity. Back in the 1970s, I followed the lead of the great Mary B, who infiltrated as an undercover journalist the uh, Imperial College Industries Research Laboratory, where they had the smoking beagles. She went in and she took those pictures you may have seen of the beagles being forced to smoke. And people campaigned against that. People campaigned by the thousands. And there were petitions and there were marches and there were goodness knows what. But those dogs were still doomed to die. And at that time, I was a young hunt saboteur. I was used to direct action. I was used to feeling empowered to take action ourselves to save lives. Woo! We did that in the past. Is this alright? Yes, yes, we have action now. What I'm trying to say, if I get there in the end, is that these dogs were stuck in that research laboratory and uh, they were doomed to die within a week and uh, everything else had been tried. So there was only one other option and that was just to go in there and take them out. And, uh, and I had it easy then. That was the first time the security was non-existent. These days you can see the barbed wire fences and the fancy cameras and the dark people and goodness knows what else. Well, none of that in those days, just walked up there and had a look in and there were the dogs. And I went back with a colleague and uh, in the night and took them out. And do you know what I want to say to you? One of the sad things was we wanted to take a lot of dogs. We had loads of leads to take them away. But we got two dogs out and we got them out onto the, uh, into the woods at the back. And they wouldn't walk. They were being stung through the pads of their feet by the nettles. They'd never been on the earth before. They'd never been on grass like that or nettles. They'd never been stung. They wouldn't walk. They had to be carried. And that's why we only got two out. And people sometimes say to me, well, you must have seen some pretty shocking things in your time. And indeed I have. And one of the lingering thoughts I have is I had to play God to those 48 dogs. There were 48 in those kennels. And I could only take two. And they all wanted to come out. And I wanted to take them all out. But I couldn't. You'd only take two. And the ones that were left behind were killed. I went back for another and I was caught with the third dog. I spent the last day of my university career. I spent the last day of my university career in the custody of Manchester Police. I ended up being charged with taking the dogs away. And I went to Nutsford Crown Court and I wanted to take them on. I wanted to take them on and put myself in front of a jury. 
and say, that is no crime, it cannot be a crime to take the dogs away like that. But we never really got the opportunity because we were threatened with all sorts of things that if you we'll make a bargain when you think agree not to take any more, we won't press the charges. And uh, I took that because I wanted to stay free and I wanted to stay active. And uh, I've had a few collisions with the law over my years. What I would say to people is the most important thing is to keep yourself free, to beat the opponents at their own game, to outsmart them. Don't put yourself in custody. I'm tired of visiting good people in prison. I want to see the animal abusers in prison. I want to see it yeah. yeah. We had another chance in the 1980s when I joined up with the, uh, as a photographer, you see I've got a camera around my neck and I've been photographing the march. It's what I do, it's my business. And I went in with the South East Animal Liberation League. And for those of you that weren't there at that time, those animal liberation leagues were the most powerful animal rights force perhaps the world has ever seen. They were highly effective and as such the establishment had to coordinate against them and shut them down. But when they went into the Royal College of Surgeons research place at Down in Kent, I went with them as a photographer. And I saw, I was asked to photograph monkeys but I went to the wrong unit and I photographed dogs. And these weren't beagles that are purpose bred for research, these were all manner of breeds, old English sheepdog, collies, labradors. Where did they get those dogs from? We never, never found the answer for that. How much loved pets would end up in a research laboratory destined to die long and painful deaths. But it wasn't just the pictures I came away with, I came away with documentation proving the mistreatment of the primates then, the monkeys were badly housed. They were subjected to all manner of cruelty as a result of that. And uh, some of the documents proved that some of the, uh, one of the primates particularly had collapsed in the full heat of summer due to inadequate ve ventilation. And the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection took them on in the courts. They prosecuted the Royal College of Surgeons for cruelty to those primates on the basis of the documents that we took away. Yeah. And Bromley magistrates listened to the evidence for eight days. They visited the place. They heard all the excuses from the Royal College of Surgeons. But at the end of the day, they convicted them of cruelty and they fined them as common criminals. That was a landmark case that was brought about by direct action. But no one would have known about it if it had not been for the South East Animal Liberation League. Sixty brave activists that went in there to get out the truth, to break down those steel doors and show the truth to the public. After that, I de deployed another tactic, because this is what I think you have to do, we have to be amorphous, we have to change our tactics. And uh, at the end of the 80s, early 90s, a colleague of mine, Melody MacDonald, she read of the horrific experiments being performed at the National Institute for Medical Research by Professor Feilberg, burning experiments on cats and rabbits. She looked him up in who's who, got his phone number. Now she could have phoned him up, and said, you're an evil, cruel bastard, and I hate you. But she did better than that. She found him up and she said, I'm fascinated in the work you do. I'd like to meet you. I'm a medical biographer. I'm trying to write a book about the use of animals in experiments. Can I meet you? And he, at 89 years old, was flattered by the interest of this attractive young lady. And he said, fine, come and meet me. And she did. And then he said, come into the laboratory and see the work I do. And that opened the door. That opened the door to the truth. And ultimately it was the end of his work. Because she got in there and she got me in there. And we spun a yarn that I was taking video film to show to students in America. And I wanted to film the work he did. And I took him a video camera. I didn't have to hide it. Stuck it on the tripod. Filmed 40 hours of tape of the work they were doing there. And you know what? They were doing burning on cats and rabbits. And some, on one occasion, something went wrong and the rabbit was squealing. 
And the guy went to shut the door in the laboratory so that no other scientists who were on the corridor could hear or see what was going on. He shut the door to stop his fellow scientists seeing the cruelty. But what he forgot was the camera on the tripod that was running the whole time. And then we got out and had enough film to prove conclusively what was going on. It was shown to the home office and you know what? Right? Within 24 hours, that experiment was ended. Yay! That is the power of the video camera. People sometimes say, this is horrific. What can I do? What can I as an individual do to make a difference? Well, we can all work a video camera. We can all deploy these sort of tactics to get in there, get amongst them, and show the public what's happening. And that's my word is an important thing. If I had my time again, do you know what I'd be? I'd be a lawyer. Because I think if we had decent, good, campaigning, activist lawyers on our side, we could tie our opponents up in so many knots they wouldn't know which way to twist or turn. So please, if you're a young person, and most of you are here, Think of different ways to advance this cause. You know, I've been involved now for too many years, and I wouldn't like you at the age of 18 that might be standing there, I wouldn't like you in 40 years' time to still be here fighting the oh, same yeah. battles. We have to find a different way, but we can do it, and uh, I'm sure we will. And if I leave him with one thought, you know, people sometimes say, well, what is the nature of the crime of intersection? When I went into a biomedical primate research centre in Holland and saw primates in there, I asked them how long they'd been in there, and they said 20 years. 20 years, these primates! Their birthright is the open jungle, and they're locked up in these units. Some of them in a unit where they can touch the ceiling, they can touch the sides, they can touch behind them and in front of them, and that is their whole world. This is dreadful. This is a crime. It's a crime, the measure which will one day be recognized. And when it is, people will say, why on earth was that allowed to continue? Why on earth? And if we, together, feeling empowered, we can put an end to this. But please, stay safe, stay out of jail, put the abusers in jail, and find different ways to advance our cause. Thank you for your invitation.